in the book, it's about how we as women have so many different roles. And you know, we are wives, we are career people, we are mothers, we are daughters, we are friends, and we can feel like we have to cut ourselves into these different roles. The library was my space, and there was just so much. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the boys to have a time. So before we get started, I actually asked Jean if she could do a little bit of an elevator pitch about her story without giving too much away because there is stuff to give away. <laughs> Just letting you know. So elevator pitch, tell us what the story is about. Right. Well, I'm so happy to be here. This is my first time in Canada. Um, so I've never, I've always wanted to come, but I've never somehow managed to be here. And it is such a beautiful place. I'm so happy to be here. And to be here with the amazing Angela is incredible. She just met me. Just, you know. <laughs> no, but she makes an impression. <laughs> You'll find out after five minutes. Um, so The Leftover Women is my new book. It came out very recently. And it is about what happens in China when a young woman gives birth and it's told shortly afterwards that her baby had died. She hears a few years later, she finds out that her daughter had not died, but had been placed for adoption by her no good husband, that's my favorite part of the synopsis, <laughs> placed for adoption by her no good husband to a wealthy American couple. And when the novel begins, Jasmine has followed her daughter to New York City to get her back. And you know it's because of the Chinese one-child policy, which was in place for several decades in China, and families were forced to have one child. So they had a girl, he wanted a boy. So in order to have a boy, they had to get rid of the girl. Um, so uh, the story is told from two points of view, from Jasmine's point of view, the birth mother, and from Rebecca's point of view. And Rebecca is a wealthy publishing executive in New York City with a handsome husband, a beautiful home, um, a high-powered career, and an adopted Chinese daughter she absolutely adores. So the two women are on a collision course. The book is about two mothers, two worlds, and one impossible choice. Mm, yeah, I read this in one weekend, like literally, <laughs> one to, cover to cover. I want to ask you about the, the title of the story before I let you read a little bit, because I don't know how many of you, how many of you have finished the story already, and how many of you are into it? Right, so there you are. Okay, so let's start with, where did the title come from? Well, that's a great question, right? So, and, and you know as a novelist yourself, sometimes um, titles are a gift, mm -hmm. and sometimes they are excruciating. <laughs> and a title is something that your publisher will have literal panic attacks about, because you can launch a book even when it's not finished. Mm -hmm. You can launch it when there are large imperfections in the book, but you cannot launch a book without the title. 100%. Because if you don't have the right title, you're going to be telling everybody to get excited about this book that's coming out, and then it's a totally different title, and nobody knows what you're talking about anymore. So I've had my editor be like, we need a title. What's the title we need? Like, you've got a brainstorm, Gene. Um, so I've had that where I have like been coming up with increasingly bad titles yep. as the date approaches, you know, like titles that sound like Chinese restaurants, you know, like the Jade Pavilion, oh, you know, no. so yes, so that it's like, it's gone very bad. Okay. But this title was a gift. I did know the title from the beginning. It has several meanings in the book. One is the actual factual meaning. Mm. And what that is, is that the one child policy was in place in China for several decades. And it had a tremendous impact in a male-dominated society that was used to having big families and the family line being carried through boys, that suddenly they were allowed one kid and everybody thought they needed to have a boy or else. Right. And the result of that policy is that in China today, there are 32 million more Chinese men than women. 32 million. And the birth rate is 50-50, so you can do the math. We are missing 32 million Chinese girls. So um, 
that, you know, the Chinese government thought the birth rate was too high and implemented this policy to force it to decline. They did too good a job. Mm -hmm. And of course, with 32 million extra men, they're not going to have a wife, right? And you have generations of people who are like, well, I was an only child. I don't need to have multiple children. And maybe I don't need to have children at all. Mm. So um, now what they've done is they have reversed, they have gotten rid of the one child policy. And instead, there's a new propaganda campaign. And what it is, is that if you are a woman of a certain age in China and you are not married, <clears throat> not with children, there's a propaganda campaign against them because um, they are saying that these women are kind of wasteful. Mm -hmm. They're not a part of society. They're not contributing, and those women are called leftover women. So the title is a reference to the way that that policy has flip-flopped and yet is still somehow the women's fault. Um, <clears throat> but in the book, it has a different meaning because Jasmine is too young to be a leftover woman. In the book, it's about how we as women have so many different roles. And you know, we are wives, we are career people, we are mothers, we are daughters, we are friends. And we can feel like we have to cut ourselves into these different roles to be palatable. And um, she says, Jasmine says in the book, when everybody has taken what they want from me, I am what is left. Which any of us could say, quite frankly. I, right. It's absolutely. absolutely. You know, such a moment that could have been empowering for women to so many, so many women and then this many men. Well, men should be chasing this, right? Like it's, <coughs> That's what I thought right? too. And when I was doing the research, I was so shocked because indeed I thought in a situation where women are so scarce, yeah. they'd have all the power and yet it does not seem like they do it's from amazing. all of the nonfiction accounts I have read. That's amazing. I mean, that just shows you the power of a government to change, to spin, to spin mm -hmm. the thing. So why don't you give us a little bit of a reading? Do you mind? Sure. That'd be amazing. So I'm going to read a little bit from the first chapter. And what has happened is that Jasmine has paid off the Chinese mafia right. to smuggle her into New York City. And she therefore owes a huge amount of money that she's got to pay back by getting a job. But she doesn't have the right documentation. She doesn't speak English. She doesn't have the skills. And so she is in a restaurant um, looking for work. A small man wearing a wrinkled suit, much too big for him, exited the kitchen and approached me. He looked as tired as his faded eyes. You're looking for work? What's your name? I started to push my glasses up my nose, then realized I'd taken them off. I felt exposed without them, especially with the two women watching us. How many times had I already had this conversation? Could I trust him not to report me? Um, I, I'm, I'm a very hard worker. He barked out a laugh. Let me guess, you don't have the right paperwork and you want me to give you a job, even though you're too scared to even tell me your real name. Forget it. I can clean tables, waitress, serve dim sum. I have a good memory. My heart was racing. I was talking too quickly. I couldn't return to China in my disastrous life there. I closed my eyes. I passed a menu board. What had it said? Your specials today are braised pork and gravy, shrimp with vermicelli and garlic, and vegetarian crystal dumplings. He paused. Can you come in full time? A few nights a week, he shrugged. I have people lining up to work 24 hours a day, especially if they're in your situation. In my peripheral vision, I noticed both women perk up as a young man stepped past us on his way to the kitchen. He was hunched over, his head averted, as if trying to make himself less conspicuous. He wore a navy jacket with an elaborate emblem on the sleeve. A worn guitar case was slung over his back. The manager spotted him and erupted like a bulldog confronting a Doberman in the street. What do you think this is, a storage area? The beleaguered man took a deep breath but didn't stop. 
I'm so sorry, I'll stash the guitar, you won't notice. There was something familiar about his warm tenor that called to me. I didn't recognize the voice, rather the inflection of his Chinese, the rhythm of his words. I tended to avoid young men with their grabby hands and clinging eyes, but I was riveted to this one. His hair was dark and silky, the gleam of amber highlights visible even in the fluorescent lighting. Come here. The manager actually stomped his foot. The man slowly turned towards us, and when he caught sight of me, he froze. My heart lurched. I stared into a face that I both knew and didn't know at all. Two thick slashes of eyebrows, dusky skin, a square masculine face with eyes like melted chocolate, Anthony. He was etched into my soul and yet entirely new to me. I remembered gangly shoulders, a broad opened grin, his thin fingers plucking on guitar strings while perched on the steps of his house, one of the largest in our village. Then his family moved away and it stood empty with me staring into the windows day after day. My eyes rested upon the man, but my soul recognized a boy I hadn't seen in 10 years, my best friend when I was 14 years old. He was gaping at me. Then he whispered, it's you. Ooh. Such a good scene. I love that scene. That's a very good scene and beautifully written. Like, can I just say that as a writer, I, I am always in awe of people who can like bring me into a scene and I can visualize it. I can almost like touch this person and see his hair and just gorgeous. I loved it. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> so you chose to use first person for Jasmine, who's in that scene, and third person for Rebecca. So I just had a curiosity. Can you tell us about that choice? Well, so as I said earlier, the book is told from the point of view of Jasmine, the birth mother, and of Rebecca, oh. the adoptive mother, who is white. Right. And so it's very obvious kind of the ways in which I can put myself into Jasmine, because of course I'm also Chinese. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a very old fashioned family where boys and men were meant to rule the house. I was considered a very bad daughter um, for until now, basically, because I am, you know, a terrible, terrible cook right. and a worse housekeeper and I'm not obedient and... Oh, you and I are going to get along just fine. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, we're two of a kind up here on the stage. Um, and I was also a dreamy, impractical child who wasn't sweeping the floor, but like staring out the window or had my nose in a book. So um, there are a lot of ways in which the story is very personal to me because Jasmine is so close to my heart. But Rebecca is too, because Rebecca, even though she's white, she's a modern career woman and she's smart. She says at the beginning, she and her husband, her friends call them beauty and the brains and she's the brains, you know? <laughs> and you know, that says it all about Rebecca. She's smart, she's high powered. She has a great career, she's serious about her career, but she's also like doing her best to be a mom and to be a wife and to take care of everyone and to live up to the burden of her privilege because she also didn't ask to be born into privilege any more than Jasmine asked to be born into poverty. And so Rebecca is also very close to my heart. And in the first draft, they were both in first person. Oh, interesting. Yes. But, you know, and you can do that. You can have two first person points of view. But I thought it was maybe a little bit confusing for the reader, even though one was in present and one was in past tense. And then it just felt right to move Rebecca a little bit further away from me mm -hmm. because I am not white and she is a white character. So even though I felt very close to her, I thought we can do a close third where we're saying she, her, but we are following her very closely and in her mind mm -hmm. and in her heart as well. And I thought that for the reader, that that was also an easier lift that you can then very clearly differentiate between the two women. It's true, I could, and that was really helpful. And I'm Asian, so I also saw myself very much in Jasmine and 
some of, some of Rebecca as well. I actually did have a question about that. Um, I'm gonna let you have a glass of water though. Guys, are you getting your questions ready? Because we're gonna do a Q&A at the end of this. I just wanna mention it. Um, when I write my stories, there's a lot of me in them, right? There always is. Actually, when I wrote my first book, my sister was like, you get that you're the detective and the best friend is me. And I'm like, what are you even talking about? But she's right, we, we insert a lot of ourselves. So can you tell us about that a little bit? How much of you are in these main characters? I think that's really true. And in fact, Angela has a great story about optioning that first book <laughs> that we have to get to before um, we end. But um, yeah, there's so much of you yeah. in every single character, including the villains, Yes. right? The villains are all us too. So although they can be inspired by people outside of us, let's yeah. say that. But you know, we are, we place ourselves in every single character in the book. And indeed, I feel very close to both Jasmine and to Rebecca. And in one of, after writing one of my first drafts, I had an early reader who said, well, you should really emphasize um, Rebecca's evilness huh. and make her fully into the villain so that the reader knows who to root for. And then we can all be like, oh, will Jasmine overcome you know, Rebecca or not? And I was like, but I love Rebecca. Mm -hmm. I do, I love Jasmine, but I love Rebecca too. And I really didn't want to do that because I felt like that would be saying that in every adoptive situation, the child belongs to the birth mother. And I don't think that's true. Hmm. I think you have a very compelling argument for both sides. You know, the birth mother obviously, since she didn't even know, has a huge right to the child. Legally, I found out it's a gray area. Hmm. So it's not really clear that the child should go back to the birth mother. And the adoptive mother can, in this situation, can offer the child a much better life than the birth mother can, and maybe even more powerfully, she is the mother as far as the child is concerned. You know, I mean, from baby on, the kid grew up with her and loves her as her mother with all her heart. So, you know, it's a very complex issue. And so I really wanted the book um, to make it so that as the reader, you're team Jasmine, team Rebecca, you f see both sides and you're like, oh my gosh, how is this going to be resolved at the end? I was team not when, <laughs> I, yes, just to be clear. That's right, not that's when. right. When is the husband, he is the no good husband. Who gave away the baby. Yes, who is hot on Jasmine's trail. Yep, Yes. he's in the team no. Um, so you talked about it just a little right there. Where you Do you think this is a commentary on parenting? Do you think you're making a statement about parenting in this story? Absolutely. I mean, I do think that um, the book is about being a parent and also being a child, right? And it's very much about being a woman as well. What it's like to be in all of those roles and how we judge people and how I think especially immigrants and women are often not seen as they see themselves. And um, I remember when my kids were little, we were on an airplane with the baby and my husband changed the baby's diaper. And to hear the flight attendants, it was like the Messiah had come. You know, <laughs> oh my gosh, what a clever, lovely, oh brilliant, competent man changing the baby's diaper. And I was just like, um, you know, I, I, I changed a diaper or two in my life. And basically they all lined up and sang in chorus, nobody cares, you know, nobody cared that I had changed a million diapers and he had changed one diaper. Um, and I think that that is something that happens to us a lot. And I have certainly pretty much killed myself trying to fulfill so many roles at the same time. And I think that no one is harder on ourselves than we are where you think, oh, why couldn't I go to that high-powered meeting and be at my kid's bake sale at the same time, and then feeling guilty about not being able to do 
you know, everything all at once. And what you're talking about isn't even balance. It's like the idealized balance. It's like not even possible balance, which is what Rebecca is dealing with. That's Can you right. tell us a little bit more about her, about her in her grounding and her scenes? Well, you know, Rebecca, like I said, she seems to have the perfect life when we meet her. And she's a publishing executive. So that was really fun to have a kind of insider look at the publishing world, which by the way, is insane, <laughs> yeah. right? It is the craziest world because it's a lovely, lovely place filled with wonderful people, but all of the official rules are not the rules that anybody follows. Everyone's kind of doing their own thing and their own unspoken rules, which you somehow are supposed to know, even though you don't know. Um, Real Housewives has nothing on the publishing. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. So that was fun to have her in this world. Um, but Rebecca was born into privilege, but she's aware of it. And she was brought up by a father who actually also wanted a boy and who taught her, you have to earn your privilege. You know, you were born into such an incredible situation. You need to strive to deserve the wealth, the comfort you know, that you have. And she is trying. Yeah. And she feels like she will never be good enough. Exactly. And of course, her life crumbles before our eyes. You know, what kind of book would it be otherwise? Um, but you know, she pulls it back together, too. I mean, she, she has a lot of challenges. She's got a publishing scandal that's just hit her, that she's got to save to save her career. She starts to wonder if her husband is having an affair. We start to wonder if Rebecca is having an affair. You know, so all of these things are in the air, plus her child is in more jeopardy than she knows. Yeah. There's so many parallels about motherhood and responsibility and self-sufficiency in this story. And I feel like there's times, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a plot graph, but you know how it's supposed to go like this, but I feel like the plots for these two women kind of go like this and they weave beautifully. Can you talk a bit about that? Did you write one and then the other and then slide them together or how did that even happen? Because it's beautiful. One goes up, one goes down. One goes up, one goes down. Yeah, it is. Um, well, thank you for your very kind words, especially coming from such an accomplished novelist. But The Leftover Women is hopefully a very propulsive read. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, in the US where it's been out, I think about a week and a half, almost two weeks now, and I've just been doing a book tour there. People are coming to the readings who've actually already finished it. I'm like, how did you finish it? Like, it's just available. They're like, well, I thought I'd read a chapter and then I couldn't stop. Same thing. Good. Totally good, happened great, to me. Great. Great. <laughs> Excellent. Um, but the 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 thing is that it's a, hopefully an easy read, but it has a very complex architecture underneath the surface because there are twists in it. And in order for the twist to work, I have to make sure that everything is in place, even though the reader might not see it until a certain moment, until the right moment. So I did do a yeah. lot of designing with this book. I couldn't plan the whole thing in advance, but I knew the twist. I knew the big plot points um, at the beginning. And then I kept going back and forth. So sometimes I would write one story and then I would write the other one, but I was always very aware of them interweaving because I wanted the reader to have questions that were being answered, but like compelling enough that you're not gonna put the book down. When we cut from Rebecca yeah. to Jasmine, for example, where you just feel constantly like, oh, well, I wanna know about that. I'll just read a little bit more because I wanna know about that too. And now we understand that, but that opens up this next question. So it, I did, so I write and then I go back and I outline what I've written okay. to try to understand what I've done. So you're not, so you're a, you're a plotter then? You like I to am. plot ahead of time. Is that true for all the books? No, I've become more and more of a plotter, huh. I think, as I've gone along in my writing career. My first book, Girl in Translation, I only had a vague idea of the end. Mm -hmm. But um, no, now I, I I'm not able to fully plot the whole thing, but I'm constantly moving back and forth, and I'm very aware mm. of the structure, because I think if the structure fails, the whole book kind of collapses. What about you? Do you plot, Angela? I'm a pantser. Which You're is, a pantser? It's terrifying. Oh my god. Because, so tell them what that means, so oh, just for the non-writers. So fly by the seat of my pants, which is extremely dangerous when you write detective fiction, because you have oh. no idea who did it. And you're just kind of wandering along, hoping you figure it out. And 
Really? Knock on wood, four books in for detective fiction. I figured it out every time. But that moment when I figure out who did it is a big moment. It's a big moment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. I wish I could plot. I just, I've never managed to. I can plot screenplays, but I can't plot books for whatever reason. I don't that, know. That is so maybe because you're following the voice. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe you're just crazy. You know? know? There are people who are intuitive writers who can write these books that like pull you through all the way to the end and they just kind of feel their way to the end. I really can't do that. I have to, I really have to know and kind of yeah. build it on a solid foundation. Are you a visual person? Do you do it like with sticky I do. notes? I you have do. I have sticky notes, I have Love charts, it. I have a very complex timeline. Oh, and I have um, I have a Google calendar, an alternate Google calendar, in which I like do all the murders. And oh. you know, if anybody were ever to find that, or my <laughs> Google history, like that would be a very scary place to look. Yeah, if the oh. FBI is listening right now, that's not real. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's very cool. So uh, can we talk a little bit about the male characters in this story? Because they have a lot of flesh around the bones. They're not just like side periphery people. I truly hate when, and I know him quite well, I feel. Um, so can you tell us about the male characters? Yeah, there are a couple of men in the book. And I have to say, by the way, that with all my plotting, there was like going to be an extra romantic entanglement oh. that was going to be a big plot point. And then I got the characters into the situation, and she was like, I'm not doing him. <laughs> Totally happens. <laughs> she was like, no way am I gonna like enter into that arena with this guy. And I was like, oh. So I had to dismantle that whole plot story and like find something else to happen. Um, so that's the thing. You can plot, but in the end, you do have to listen to your characters and be true to who they really are and who they want. And you get to know them better as the story goes along. But I would say there are a couple of men, oh, sorry, there are a couple of serious men in the book. We have Anthony, mm -hmm. who we just met, who is um, Jasmine's childhood friend. And um, this scene, I have to tell you, does not actually end well because he's mad at her. Because when she got married to Wen, who is her husband, the no good husband, um, she had to break off her friendship with him, and he's still kind of bitter about that. But she catches the glimpse of a bracelet, a red thread bracelet on Anthony's wrist in that scene, and she's thinking, is that the same bracelet I gave him? And so you have to read the book to find out. But so she and Anthony have a thing going on. We have Rebecca, and she has a brilliant language prodigy husband named Brandon, who is white but speaks Chinese fluently, and therefore forms almost like a mini family in Rebecca's family, because Rebecca has a Chinese nanny named Lucy, and Lucy speaks Chinese, Brandon speaks Chinese, and Fifi, the child, speaks Chinese. So sometimes Rebecca feels like a stranger yeah. in her own home. And I wanted that situation because so many immigrant parents feel that way in their own home. Mm -hmm. Because especially like my mom never really learned to speak English. I know that she was very fearful when I was speaking English on the phone with my friends because she didn't understand. And there becomes this kind of gulf between the mother and the child because, or the father and the child, because of that language barrier. So we have Brandon, who's very handsome, the beauty in the, in the situation, but he acknowledges that the real brilliant part of that couple is Rebecca. Um, and then we've got Wen, the no good husband, who, you know, we do hate him, mm -hmm. but <laughs> she echoes that. I really we, don't like him. Yes, we do hate him. <laughs> but, you know, he believes, like he believes in his, in his argument. I yeah. mean, he believes that, and there is truth to it, that China's economic system would have crumbled without something like the one-child policy, and that it saved China, and it brought China economic prosperity and that they had no choice and that he had saved the daughter from death, you know, that he hadn't left her on the side of the road to die like people who I had interviewed and yeah. spoken to, but he had, you know, just given her a better life um, in the West and he 
totally believes in that argument. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the main men. And then there's also a kind of guy who's a colleague, who's a competitor to Rebecca, um, where, named Mason, where we wonder what exactly happened between Rebecca and Mason at the Frankfurt Book Fair. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's also a subplot um, with him as well. I hear stories about the Frankfurt Book Fair. The Frankfurt Book Fair, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, interior and exterior lives. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because there's a lot, I mean, I'm not gonna give away anything, but interiorly what we know and exteriorly what we know. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's such a great question. I mean, I think that when we read Jasmine, mm -hmm. we feel like we're so close to her and that she's so um, much like us. But actually, her chapters are all in Chinese. And so, of course, the book is in English, but it's in fluent enough English that we don't feel a barrier. But that is her inner life. Mm -hmm. Her expressions are Chinese. Her thoughts are Chinese. She's actually speaking Chinese in her chapters. And then sometimes we suddenly hear her speak English yep. and we realize, wow, she, her English is not good. Her English is very simple and very elementary. And that tells us something about what might happen when we encounter someone in our lives who might seem very different on the outside than they are on the inside. We often come across people who don't speak English fluently, and it's very easy to make an assumption about their intelligence or their level of education based on their English. But I'm hoping to show with the book and with actually the big plot twist in the book that how we see people is very different from who they might be on the inside. It's book by their cover, right? Judging books by their cover. I love how you do that in this story because it's not like a, you need to know this thing. It's just like a sub message that kind of drifts through it. And I love that. It's beautiful. I need to ask what's next for The Leftover Woman. Well, I am working on a new book, um, and the new book is A Murder Set at Harvard. Oh. So yes, so that's, uh, that's what Where I'm Where you went? On. Yes, yeah. I did. I did go to Harvard. I was very, very poor as a child. Um, and it was clear to my family that the only choice that there was in my life was either to stay working at the factory where I you know, worked as a kid in New York, or to find some guy willing to marry me, and they were in despair that they would right. ever find such a man because mm -hmm. I'm such a terrible Chinese daughter uh -huh. um, and such a bad cook. Mm -hmm. So um, those were my two choices, and I thought by myself, well, I'm gonna go to Harvard instead, <laughs> and that's what I did. I feel like everyone should know those choices. <laughs> These are the choices, and then there's Harvard. That's right. That's Always right. choose Harvard. Yeah. That's right. So, but the leftover woman, woman itself is becoming a? Yes, it has been optioned yes. um, for film. And in fact, it's quite special because it was preempted. Basically, the moment we finished the manuscript, it was sold um, for film and TV. All of my books are in development, but I've never had one go as fast as this one. They are considering whether to make a film from it mm. or a streaming series. And I think most likely it will be um, a streaming series, a limited streaming series for Netflix or for something like that. Mm. Um, but you've also had experience with options, Angela. So can you tell us about that with your books? I have. All of my books are currently optioned as well, though wow. I've written screenplays as well. Have you written a screenplay for this? No. Would you consider writing a screenplay? They asked me. Uh, they were oh. like, how involved? do you want to be yeah. and you know of course part of you wants to be involved but the problem is I don't know what it's like in your contracts but mm. in the US you can be a writer and be involved but you have no power mm. so that means that an executive can come in and make decisions about what happens to the characters and their decision goes yeah. and I thought it would kill me yeah. to be a writer on my on my show and not to have the ultimate decision about what happens. So I am involved as executive producer in Got a it. consulting role, um, but since I won't have any power anyway, I thought it's better to have some distance. What about, what about you? 
I was lucky. I got into the um, Canadian Film School's scholarship program, and they helped me write my first uh, screenplay. Wow. And then they bought the screenplay, so that was nice. That's amazing. Yeah, but it hasn't been made, so who knows if it ever goes anywhere. Development is really difficult. To actually, I mean, to be optioned is a huge yeah. honor. Very few books are optioned, but then even few, fewer are actually made. That's a, the percentage is tiny. Yeah. A long process. It is a long process. Yeah. But you had a funny story though about how crazy some of these <laughs> option offers can be. They Do you want to share be. it? So when I was first being uh, optioned for the Portia Adams Adventures, which is a story about a 1930s detective, uh, we got on this phone with this LA producer, and 45 minutes into the call, he said something like, "What do you think if we make her a man?" A man, a man, because we don't have enough books or stories about men, obviously. Not enough male detectives in the world. You guys don't know me that well, but I had nothing. I could not. I was like, what do we even do with this? And my publisher's sitting across from me going, right? Because I, what do I even say to this? Um, I eventually said no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I had a similar experience with my second novel, Mambo in Chinatown, which is about a young girl um, in New York City, a dishwasher who becomes a dancer. And um, they got on the phone with me, and you know, they're Hollywood people, so they're very like, oh, we love you, we love the book, it's got all these themes about emancipation of women, it's so brilliant, and all of this, and so that sounds really good. And they were like, yes, we can't wait to make this into a movie set in Texas. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> like, it's such a New York story. It's yeah. all about the big city. And the, yeah. uh, to me, that is like saying, we love your book. We're going to keep everything the same, except that instead of humans, we're going to have bears, mm -hmm. and we're going to set it on a spaceship. You know, so I, I was like, all right, uh, Texas. She's going to come in on the horse. Like, yes, I see her in Texas. You know, but then I think Jane Austen, if she ever saw, you know, um, what is the movie with Alicia Silverstone? Clueless. Clueless. If she ever saw Clueless and saw, see what they made out of that, I don't know, maybe <laughs> this is our future. We'll be dead. It'll be fine.